my primary task today is to try to encourage as many of you as possible to go into a PhD program in theoretical computer science. Uh, at least, uh, I want to attempt not to discourage too many of you. So with that in view, you know, I could do one of two things. Uh, I, when I was thinking about this talk, I could do 10 great ideas that uh, theoretical computer science has come up with. Certainly there are 10 or more, but they wouldn't be related to each other. Instead, I decided to pick 10 pretty good ideas that are related so that we don't have to jump around too much. So I'm going to pick two fields and give you some ideas from those two fields. <coughs> good. Uh, I guess the title might be slightly different from the title um, you might have seen, but uh, it's uh, roughly on those lines. Uh, so the title here is Vectors, Sampling, and Massive Data. That indicates some of the topics that I want to cover in this talk. Okay. So, uh, you know, I started research before this phrase came about, data explosion. By now it's become a cliche that data has exploded. And uh, some of it is genuine. Some of it is because, uh, okay, some of it is because we have uh, uh, really an enhanced ability to collect data in the sciences, which is actually genuine, as I said. And we have the ability to store, uh, retrieve, et cetera, data, which is much more than we had before. Now, some of it is debatable. You can say some of the data that we generate is useless. And indeed, that's probably the case. But in nevertheless, our task here, we, we're not going to debate that. We're not going to debate whether it's useful or not. But our task is actually to try to see what we can do with this data. Right? Now, the one challenge that you always hear is, uh, certainly algorithms have been the bulwark of the improvements we have seen in the last few decades. So what are good algorithms to deal with this massive data? But that's not what I want to talk about in this talk. In this talk, I want to actually, um, as I said, the task, uh, this talk is really addressed to undergraduates like uh, most of the audience. Uh, to induce you to go into computer science. So uh, I want to ask what fundamental new areas of mathematics of computer science of the sciences would be useful in this task. Now, I put the word new in quotes there, and that's for a reason, because these are not really, really new. They are uh, always uh, in the history of science. There's always things that have happened before that influence what goes on. So in that sense, they are not new, but there are new methodologies in those areas. And I want to tell you why also. This pertains to the remark I already made. So I don't want to give you uh, one snippet here, one snippet here, and so on. I want to give you sort of what you might call verticals, where I describe a couple of things in somewhat detail, with the whys and hows and everything thrown in. Okay. Uh, I should uh, thank John Hopcroft, who's a co-author on this effort. Uh, we are writing a book. so. A lot of the ideas are developed together with him. So some new areas. Probability and statistics I list as one of the big areas. You will see why I'm listing this, and I'll explain that. Really, it's not new. Of course, they've been around, but our viewpoint is going to be different. The second, also not entirely new, and again, the viewpoint is different, is I'm going to list linear algebra. Now, uh, some of you have had linear algebra courses after calculus or with calculus. Some of you haven't. If you haven't, if you take away from this talk one thing, and that is please pay attention to your linear algebra. If you haven't had a course, do it. It's very important and very useful, including in modern research, as I'll try to tell you. Now, there's a point of departure from, I mean, you've all seen vectors, perhaps. There's a point of departure from what you see in physics. In physics, you see two, three, five-dimensional or six-dimensional vectors. Here we are going to see vectors in hundreds of dimensions. That's very important, it turns out, for modern computer science, not just for mathematics. Okay. Uh, some more areas. Optimization is very important, uh, both linear and nonlinear. Uh, now, machine learning is a subject that <coughs> really, uh, I work in algorithms. I'm a theoretical computer scientist. Uh, we are actually quite envious of machine learning because it's captured everything and it can solve all problems. Uh, well, it, it can actually solve some problems very well. So that's, that's an interesting thing, and I'll try to tell you how to marry machine learning, perhaps, with algorithms a little bit. Markov chains is an area that uh, uh, also is very important. I won't go into that. Uh, as I said here, here I'll focus on the first two, not jump around too much. 
Okay. Um, so the first, uh, first thing, as the uh, little title of the section on top says, is probability and statistics. And here I want to start with an analogy. What happened in physics in the 19th century was you understood simple atoms, and then you went to more and more complicated atoms, which had more electrons. And as the number of particles got bigger, life got more complicated. The so-called n-body problem was a very difficult problem to solve in 19th century physics, except towards some part of the century, the middle of the century or later, they realized, well, things get much easier if, if you actually assume the number of particles is infinite, right? In reality, it's not, but it turns out it makes life a lot easier because uh, the system is not infinite. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, but understanding this uh, sort of abstraction where you go to infinitely many particles or infinitely many things, whatever those things are, uh, is going to give us insight into the real thing. Now, the one nice thing about going to infinity is you don't have to be precise. Nobody expects you to answer exactly what's going to happen. People only expect statistics, and indeed, those are very useful uh, for real problems. Okay, now, the first infinite thing that we all can relate to is the web. It's not really infinite. There are at least, at least, in fact, probably more 10 to the 11 pages, right? Uh, lots of pages and counting. Now, what is the basic structure of the web? To understand that, people have looked at, there are many things to look at, but one basic thing to look at is hypertext links. So a page I points to a page J, then I would put a directed edge. I'll put down a point or a node for each page, and I'll put a directed edge from I to J to say that there is a link from page I to page J. Now, sometimes I've, I've drawn an arrow here, and sometimes these arrows are not necessary. That's, it's really bi-directional. It doesn't flow in one direction, uh, as, in fact, the next example shows you. In a social network, which is another thing we analyze, which is also very large, you can assume there are infinitely many people as an approximation. An edge must, might go from I to J to say that I knows J, but this is mutual. They know each other rather than um, one knowing the other and not the other way around. Okay. So the simplex, again, I'm going to simplify matters to get a good idea, and I'll tell you why that's useful. The simplest thing you can do here is put down one vertex for each person, let's say. I'm going to deal with the undirected case. The number of vertices n I'm going to allow to be infinity. And for, again, simplicity, I'm going to assume that you put in each of those n choose two connections. So every pair of people either knows or doesn't know each other. And that's going to be random with probability some p. I don't tell you p yet. We'll come to it. Each pair decides they know each other. Or with probability 1 minus p, they decide they don't know each other. Right? But this happens independently of each other. They don't collude. They don't talk to each other and decide. This happens independently. That's a big assumption. But that makes life a lot simpler, and we have just two parameters, n, num number of people, and p, the probability that a pair knows each other, right? Um, Erdos and René, two very famous mathematicians, didn't know the web. Erdos actually lived till about 10 years ago, very uh, pioneering, famous mathematician, didn't interest himself very much in algorithms or computer science. But still, it turned out that this fundamental theory they developed purely for mathematical reasons is useful to us. They started developing this theory in the 50s and 60s. So here's a picture, perhaps, that explains better what is going on. They called it the evolution of random graphs. So evolution really is going to mean I'm going to increase p, the probability of knowing each other, from 0 onwards and see what happens. At p equals 0, well, that means each person knows on the average 0 people. Nobody knows each other. So everybody is isolated. Now, I haven't drawn all the pictures. I'm going to draw two interesting and important pictures. Uh, the middle picture is when everybody knows, on the average, 0.99 people, slightly less than one. Then you will see that. Uh, you won't see the red. OK, so this. Yeah. Uh, I hope you can see the picture. So some pairs of people know each other. Some pairs don't. Some of them are isolated, like uh, in this corner. And some of them are connected. Now, I, I increase this threshold to slightly above 1. I make everybody know 1.01 people, right? Just slightly above 1. And suddenly something uh, very sudden, 
which didn't happen before happens, what's called a giant component form. That is, a lot of people know each other indirectly. A knows B knows C and so on. A lot of people know each other indirectly. That set is very big. It's a giant. What is a giant? A giant component is something that has a constant non-vanishing fraction of all nodes. So n is going to infinity. Vanishing means that fraction goes to 0, but it doesn't if everybody knows more than one person. So we can ask, when do we have a network of people where the no relationship is big, is a fraction of the vertices? And the theorem that Erdős and René proved, this theorem is not that easy. It looks actually innocuous, as will be several facts I will state. The mathematical proof takes some work. Okay. They prove that as soon as each person knows, on the average, more than one person, then there's a giant component. Okay. Uh, again, it's simple sounding, but hard to prove. Uh, it turns out now they didn't have it, but we now have very large graphs, the web and social networks and many examples like that. Uh, and in fact, giant components are often observed, but the mathematical proof came earlier. Uh, so uh, this is. Uh, I, don't, I won't talk very much about reality, but because I'm a theoretician, as you will detect if you haven't known that already. But uh, maybe one slide on reality won't hurt us too much, so I put up one here. Uh, is this model real? Okay. Now, for a model to be real, you have to check it against an observable real thing. Here is an important observable real thing. You can go to a social network and ask how many people each person knows. At least you can take a sample. Okay sample of the population and ask them how many people each person knows. Now, what the model predicts, the erdos model predicts is, if on the average each person knows 1.01 people, the model says no one will know more than about log n people, let's say 40 people in any realistic network, right? But in reality, that's false. In reality, there are very gregarious people that know a lot and a lot of people, many more than the average, right? Ah. OK, thank you. Yeah, there it is. Thank you. So this phenomenon is called heavy tails. Without explaining it, in a probability distribution, heavy tails means lots of probability far away from the mean. And that happens in real networks. So how do we explain that? We want in this talk, there are, in fact, other models. And this is the subject of much current research. Okay. Um, now back to our model. I want to remark on one thing that, again, happens in a lot of other situations. This is called a threshold phenomenon. So I, I vaguely alluded to that. So what happens is that as the probability of edges increases, that is, as the average number of people each person knows increases, there's a sudden point where a giant component forms. Before that, there is no giants. After that, there is giants. There's a sudden jump. This is called a threshold because of the sudden jump. And this was studied by many people. Uh, now. There are thresholds in other areas as well. And I want to remark on one area that's of some interest. Uh, if you don't know what a satisfiability formula is, um, just blank out for the slide and come back later. If you know, then you'll follow this. It's a formula like this in a lot of variables. Here, there are at least 265 variables. And I haven't shown you all that. There are clauses which are constraints on the variables. It says the variables must satisfy this thing. right? Now you would guess that the following might be true if there are not too many clauses, if there are not too many constraints, then there would be a solution. There would be a way to satisfy them. But if there are too many constraints, if there are too many constraints, there wouldn't be a way. But in fact, a sharp phenomenon holds that if the number of constraints exceed a constant times the variables, the solution suddenly stops being there. Before that, there is a solution. Okay. This is another threshold phenomenon. Now, why does one care about this? Okay. And perhaps here I'll relate it a little bit to reality. This is the rule of thumb. Uh, this problem, the satisfiability problem, occurs often in practice. You can take a lot of practical problems that you'll encounter and pose it as satisfiability problems, and then you need to know whether it has a solution or not. It turns out that's a very hard thing to decide in general. So this provides a rule of thumb that says if there are so many clauses, it's satisfied. If there are many more, no, it's not. Okay. And indeed, uh, the area of, of solving satisfiability problems in practice 
is an area of current research. People build better and better fat solvers. One of the first things they tested against is this threshold and see how it works on random samples. So I think that was part one. I said I'll cover two topics. The second topic is vectors. Okay. Uh, that was part one was probability in statistics. The second topic is vectors. And I'll try to relate the two um, towards the end. Okay. So before I start on that, you've all seen in your physics classes or calculus classes two-dimensional and three-dimensional vectors. Position in the plane when a particle is moving or in free space, perhaps time is another coordinate. But in computer science and related areas, what we can do is often model data as vectors. It turns out the model produces very high dimensional vectors, hundreds of dimensions. Okay. Now, there is no geometry in the problem to start with. We put geometry on it artificially, but it turns out to be very useful. Uh, the first such model was formulated in a sense in the 60s and 70s by Terry Salton, uh, who dealt with information retrieval. So I'm going to call it Salton's uh, vector space model. He modeled a document as a vector and a collection of documents as a collection of vectors. We'll see uh, in what way. <clears throat> so you have a bunch of documents, perhaps a bunch of news items from a particular year. The documents contain terms. Terms are just words. Perhaps you drop simple words like articles, but they are words in the document. There are many words, D words, let's say. D is often in the tens of thousands. In English, you know, you could have 25,000 words. Uh, and so each document contains some of those words, some of them repeated, right? <clears throat> I take a document, or at least Salton took a document, and said, I'm going to throw away the book, or whatever document it is, and put down a vector with D components. And the components list the frequency, the number of occurrences of each term in the document. So for each document, I turn it into a 25,000 dimensional vector. Not three or four, but 25,000 dimensional vector. Okay. Uh, and uh, perhaps a picture will illustrate this better. So here was one document, the red book. Okay. It does not have any of those words, the top few, abacus and adblock. It does have a lot of the other words. Right? With, with a lot of frequency. So I represent the red book as one column vector. Right? Many, many components. I have a collection of books, and that looks like that matrix. One column per book, right? So why did I do this? What good is it? They were not vectors to start with. They were just documents. Okay. Uh, second example before I tell you why, uh, which has also been very useful. You can represent web pages as vectors. It's the same picture I showed you earlier with an arrow edge. You have a collection of D pages. Each page you represent as a 0, 1 vector, telling you whether it points to a particular page or not. Now, you never want to write down this vector. This vector has mostly zeros. Uh, an average web page points to seven other web pages. Whereas, as I said, there are at least 10 to the 10 web pages. You have a 10 to the 10 dimensional vector. Almost all of it is 0, and you never want to write it down. But that's a detail we won't go into here. You imagine here for this talk, the vector being written down fully. You wouldn't go wrong. Right? So, um, and of course, uh, Salton's work was very early. By now, uh, many, many things are represented as feature vectors. Here are some examples. So this is an important way of representing data. And we'll try to see why it's useful. Before that, I want to put down some pictures. I mean, if you've seen vectors, you've seen dot products. So you can ask whether dot products are useful. And here for that, uh, I've shown you two vectors, web page four on your list of pages, page five. Page five points to page one, page two, page three, but doesn't point to four and five, points to six. Now, the dot product gives you common ones, right? Every time there's a common one, the dot product, you add one. So the dot product is the number of common links. And you can work out that distance means something. And a little later, we'll see that when you talk about vectors, you must immediately think of the angle between them. And that's actually a useful concept as well. Again, I want to stress, originally you started with documents. You didn't start with vector algebra. And somehow you realize that angles are useful quantities in that context. We will realize that. Okay. So 
I want to get a bit deeper in the next few slides on, uh, on vectors. So uh, let's talk about something called the best fit direction. So you have a bundle of vectors. It's probably best to look at just the picture. That's uh, simple enough for this talk. Each blue vector is one of your documents. It's been turned into a vector. I define the red vector as the unit length vector. It doesn't look unit length, but let's take that. Or as a, as a direction, which is the best fit for all these vectors. What does best fit mean? It minimizes the sum of perpendicular distances. So I drop these perpendiculars and take the square of those and add up. And that's minimized. Why I take the square, uh, it, it turns out that's a natural thing and it's important. For now, just remember this. It's a least square fit. It's a least square fit for this bunch of vectors. Now I'm going to go uh, one step further and say that I'm going to rank all the documents based on the projection to this line. So I'm going to uh, rank this document as the top one in my collection just because its projection on the red line is the maximum. And I'm going to rank this the second one just because its projection on the red line is second to that, and so on. This will seem arbitrary, it should, but we'll see that it's useful. Uh, I worked out an example. It's not important to follow that. But I do want to make a remark. If you know your linear algebra already and remember it, this is just what's called a singular vector. If you don't know your linear algebra, it doesn't matter for the flow. But it's best if you learn it in the coming years. It will be very useful. Now, this way of ranking, it says take the projection on the red line and rank accordingly, was formulated in two influential papers. One was by John Kleinberg uh, in the 90s. The second one is probably something that many of you would have potentially heard of. It's the page rank. It, it, the, I am not going to give you the details. They are related. But indeed, the page rank is inspired by such a ranking. That said, this is the way to rank all web pages in the web. And if you do a search, I'll give you out the results in this ranked order. And that turned out to be quite useful. Okay. Now, but you could have asked, when I said that, I picked the line minimizing the sum of squared errors. Why not minimize the sum of cubed errors? Why an arbitrary choice of square? That's indeed a good question. The reason these people chose that is that linear algebra has a lot of nice theory based on the fact that it's a square. If it's not, then the theory will not work. So mathematically, it's nice. That was, in fact, the only reason they picked it. But the real proof of the pudding is, in practice, whether it's useful. And indeed, it turns out to be very useful. There's a whole subject called principal component analysis, which uses such best fit directions, minimizing the sum of squared errors. Okay? Uh, and indeed, page rank is used widely. By now, it's certainly not the only thing that's used. There are many other factors. But it was a starting point. OK, now we come to the data explosion that I mentioned in the beginning. So, so far, so good. This was classical linear algebra. But data, as you know, as I just told you, has exploded. What do we do with that? So best fit vectors are widely used, but time consuming to find. How do we do it when we have a very large collection of vectors? The obvious answer to that seems to be this picture, uh, this, uh, this statement that you sample. Sampling is a process of taking a subset at random from a very large set. Because the set is too large to analyze, you analyze the subset, right? That's sampling. But there's a, a very funny, a very important problem there. So you have a collection of these blue vectors and a couple of red vectors which are very long, but very small in number. They're very long, but they're very small in number. But you want to get them because they're very important. They're long and important. If you draw an uniform sample, you'll never get them, right, if there are very few. So the problem is that not all vectors are equally important. So sampling cannot be done uniformly. So you must do something. Now, in, in traditional statistics, people have worked out what's the best way to sample. But it takes a long time to figure out what's the best way to sample. And you don't have that kind of time because the data is too large. So we want to sample on the fly very quickly and make a sensible choice of the sample. How do we do it? So here's one, um, uh, what again looks ad hoc, like the rank thing. But it turns out to be mathematically nice. So this is uh, some joint work I did with two others uh, in the 90s. Since then, there's been a lot of follow-up work. Uh, we said, 
So here is a set of vectors, the rows of this matrix. I want to pick one of them, just one of them at a time. What probability should I use? Well, set, take probabilities proportional to the squared length. So here I've calculated the sum of squares, right? These are sum of squares of each row. Then I've normalized to sum one. These are probabilities. And I pick these vectors with these probabilities. So I work that out. So I've drawn the first sample. This thing, which has probability 0.3294, which is the highest, gets picked, not surprisingly, the first time around. I draw another sample. The next time, I end up picking the one with 0.2482, which is the next highest probability. And I repeat. I can, I can pick again another time the same one I picked before. So pick rows with probability proportional length squared. How many trials you do depends on the accuracy you want. Right? But you do something which seems seemingly contradictory. Having picked the longer rows to be more likely, I then normalize all rows to length 1. This is sum of squares of 1. I've just divided so that the length is 1. So if there's not much you take away from this talk, hopefully you'll take this slide away because uh, it's very simple. So you pick with probabilities proportional to the squared length from a collection of vectors. Then you normalize everybody to length 1. OK. Now, this again seems fairly ad hoc, but it turns out, uh, and again, the proofs are a fair bit of sweat, although they seem natural. It turns out that if I found now the best fit direction for the sample, that's actually a decent fit for the whole thing. So in fact, instead of operating on the whole thing, you can operate on the sample. So that picture sort of explains, uh, don't worry about the picture now, it explains why that might be. Let's uh, compress this slide on quick compression. So forget that. So it turns out, uh, after the fact, there were quite a few uses found uh, for this length squared sampling. So if you did that, it gave you a lot of properties, and it's useful for a bunch of things. But I really want to focus on what it is not useful for, and that is this problem. If you do a, word, uh, if you do a search for a word like jaguar, which has multiple meanings, it turns out there are a lot of documents on the web which are pertaining to the car jaguar. There are relatively few that pertain to the animal jaguar. So if you're interested in the animal, you don't see so many of those documents. You have to be careful to rank them so that you see some animals and some cars. Here's one way of being careful. Now, if I, if I have a bunch of these vectors, so imagine these vectors are actually shorter than I've shown. I've shown them long so that you can see them. And these vectors are longer and more numerous. If I pick vectors according to probabilities which depend on the length squared, I'd keep picking the car. I'd almost never see the animal. But I want to see the animal, or some people will want to see the animal. How do I fix this problem? Well, here is a nice geometric way to fix the problem. I don't pick one vector at a time. I pick pairs of vectors. Pairs because there are two meanings of the word here. I pick pairs of vectors with probability proportional to the area of the triangle squared that they span. So for example, if I pick two cars, they'll both be very long vectors. But the angle between them is so small that the triangle has very small area. Base times height, right, is small. The height is small. Whereas if I pick one car and one animal, that might be almost perpendicular so that I get a lot of area and I favor those. Right? So this, this fixes the problem of having two, two meanings or two orthogonal sets of vectors. What if there are three? Now, I um, uh, have a co-author with whom I've done a lot of work called Alan Freeze. So in his honor, I made, this into, made him into a problem. And here is the freeze problem. The freeze problem, there are three meanings, at least, of the word freeze. One is the mathematician, Alan Freeze, who is my co-author. One is an architectural style. Another is a, is a magazine. And so you get very few vectors for the mathematician, right? Very short and very few. How do you fix this? Now I must pick triples of vectors and take the volume they span and try to make that as high as possible. They could have k meanings. And indeed, if you have k meanings, there's a very nice paper of actually one of my colleagues, Amit Deshpande, Radha Maher, and uh, one of my former, ad former advisees, Rampala and Wang, who said the following. So if there are 10 meanings, how do I pick somebody from each of those meanings? Right? They're likely to be orthogonal to each other. They don't have much to do with each other. They're likely to be orthogonal. So I make the probability of picking a 10 tuple at a bunch I pick 10 vectors, 
with probability proportional to the volume of the simplex. There's a 10-dimensional simplex that they span. Okay. Now you can go one step further and ask what happens if k is very large. Instead of k being 3 or 10, k is as high as the collection of documents. What happens then? Well, that's a nice subject. I won't be able to go into that, but indeed, that turns out to be also an interesting question. And there's a lot of recent work on that. What I'm going to do uh, in the next uh, couple of minutes is flash through a few slides. And if you can read it fast enough, you will know why that's interesting. Oh, OK. So I flashed too fast. Now, this is the next topic that I want. See, I want to finish with a topic which combines the two things I've talked about, probability and statistics and vectors. Uh, and uh, this, again, is a, a nice active area. So <clears throat> we'll start with one particular problem, and I'll tell you that it's more general than that. So let's say that you have a large network and logs of messages. That is, data is collected, which tells you for each message what the source, what the destination, what the number of packets was. And that's written into some central database, not in an ordered fashion, because it, it's written as the messages come. And you want to find statistics. You want to find the total traffic for the day. That's easy. Now, the model is the data is so large that you cannot store that data in your RAM and analyze it. It's what's called streaming data. Streaming data just means the data flows by as if it was a stream only once. You don't get to see it again. So as it streams by, you must do something to do whatever computation you want to do. Now, the total is easy to find. You can keep a running total. Okay. But if you want to design the network, you want things like the variance of the traffic. Variance tells you whether only certain sources and destinations hog the flow, hog the traffic, right? You need to know statistics like that. And here, what you do, it turns out, you represent the data, which has nothing to do with geometry, as a vector. And that helps you. So you take a hidden vector, think of it in your mind, you don't put it down, where it has one component for the total number of packets from each source. There are probably thousands of sources, so there's one component for each of those. It's a very high dimensional vector, right? So that seems a bad thing. I've created a very high dimensional vector. And what I'm required to find for the variance, slightly related quantities the sum of squares. I have a vector in thousands of dimensions, and I want to know the sum of squares of all the components. That's just the length of the vector squared. I actually have taken a square root. Length is just the square root of that. And it turns out there is a very nice theorem that helps you before I tell you that. If, for the moment, you assume that the component squares are all equal, this won't be the case. Let's assume that. Then you know that it's enough to find the first component square, right? Now, it turns out that indeed is going to be the case if I'm allowed to pick the coordinate axis at random. Okay? I can pick any set of coordinate axes at random, then it is the case. This is not true in two and three dimensions. If you imagine that in two and three dimensions you pick a coordinate system, this won't be, uh, this won't be valid. But it is true in high dimensions. That's a very beautiful old theorem of uh, Johnson and Lindenstrauss, which is useful. This work was done by Alon, Matthias, and Zegedi. Now I'm going to flash a few more slides at you and then do one more topic. Ah, there it is. So, so far we, have, we imagine data as vectors. It will also help sometimes to imagine solutions of the problem as vectors. You all might have heard of the traveling salesperson problem. It's a famous problem. I have a graph. Uh, this graph has uh, 4 plus 2, 6 vertices. I want to visit each vertex once and precisely once. That's called a tour. Here's a tour. I go on edge 1, edge 2, edge 3, then edge 5, then edge 15, and edge 9. So that is that tour, right? That's one way of doing it. There are many ways. Okay. Now, I'm going to be perverse and turn that tour, which has only six components, six edges in order, turn it into a 15-dimensional vector. 15 because 6 choose 2 is 15. And the vector lists what edges I use. I use edge 1, 2, 3, but I don't use edge 4. I put a 0 there. I use edge 5, not 6, 7, and 8. I use edge 9. So I lost the order. I've turned it into a much higher dimensional vector. And so what I've done is if there were n cities, I've turned 
it into an n choose two dimensional vector, which is very large. And if you ask me whether such things would have worked, almost anything I've talked about, if you asked me 15 years ago if they would have scaled up to whatever web scale, I would have said no. It's been a surprise that linear algebra and vector representations and probability play the role they do. So it's not actually a given, wasn't a given 20 years back. So uh, there are 15 edges, 60 possible toes, and I'm going to represent it in 60-dimensional space. This is nest drawn in three-dimensional space. It's a 60-dimensional picture with one corner for each toe, one vector, one corner for each toe. And somehow, the champion methods to solve this problem, in fact, do this. Nobody writes down the uh, uh, polytope, but they imagine the polytope and solve the problem by walking around its edges. So I want to conclude with, uh, leave you with this thought and skip the some more slides. <clears throat> so I hope I've convinced you, if not uh, thoroughly, but at least briefly, that vectors, geometry, and linear algebra are very user friendly. And I want to tell you this without actually having given you all the details, but I gave you one, that these high dimensional vectors are actually quite a bit nicer than three and four dimensional vectors. Basically, three and four dimensional vectors don't behave like random things and you have to understand precisely what they are to say anything, whereas in the high dimensional space, the statistics is very useful. And randomness combined with linear algebra is a very powerful tool for modern problems. So with that, I'll stop.